So I'm going to introduce our speaker of today, which is uh, who is uh, Mattia Gazzola, and who is currently an assistant professor in mechanical science and engineering department at University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. Mattia is a Blue Waters professor at the National Center for uh, Supercomputing Applications and the core faculty at the Cold Wars uh, Institute for Genomic Biology. He joined his uh, current uh, position in fall 2016 after postdoc at Harvard and a PhD at uh, ETH Zurich. His re research is uh, at the interface of, between numerics, fluid mechanics and robotics with special interest on biological proportion and biohybrid robotics. And his studies have been, uh, were awarded with um, ETH medal Swiss National uh, Science Foundation Fellowships, NSF Career, and they were featured on covers of several scientific journals, including Science, Nature, and JFM. So without further introduction, I, would, uh, I will invite Mattia to give his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sepide, for the, for the kind introduction and for inviting me today. <clears throat> and thanks to everyone for being here. So. Uh, let me let me start. So today I want to talk about um, uh, viscous streaming and how we think about viscous streaming beyond kind of um, the classic classical studies related to it and in the context of robotics and biohybrid robotics. Okay, so uh, viscous streaming is uh, is uh, an effect that is well known since many years. Um, I think the first studies date back hundred years ago or even more than that. And, um, and uh, it's a peculiar effect that um, ar um, arises from the nonlinear um, properties of the Navier-Stokes equation. And so whenever you have a body, um, a solid body that oscillates within a certain uh, frequency regime, depending on the size of the body and the viscosity of the fluid, um, then um, uh, a steady, even though the motion is unsteady, uh, a steady component in the flow arises and then the that is the streaming uh, flow field, which is the time average um, flow field. And so what you see here is an image from Van Dyke where uh, um, a, a cylinder is oscillated um, quickly um, from left to right. And, um, <clears throat> and these are the, the streamlines uh, that you can see, uh, the path lines when you image the, par uh, the particles injected into the flow. And you can see how the, the viscous streaming pattern really divides the domain neatly in different, in different regions. And so this, this um, uh, phenomenon is, is, has been studied, as I said, um, since many years, and it's been well understood in the case of, for example, cylinders and spheres, and has been applied successfully to dry particles, mixed particles, separate particles, especially in, in uh, modern inertial microfluidics. So it's a very useful phenomenon that can be used, at, uh, it's typically used at the micro scale. Uh, one thing that is striking, though, is that although we know very well what happens both theoretically and experimentally in the case of simple shapes like a cylinder or a sphere, uh, very little is known in the case of more complex geometries. And um, uh, there is only a handful of studies that looked at simple variation over, over the cylinders, but really we don't know much about it. We don't know how the streaming flows look like in, this, in these cases. And we did, don't really understand how, um, you know, we, how we can manipulate the flow topology of the streaming field uh, in, these, in these scenarios. And so that's, that's what we are interested in. And the reason why the motivation why we are interested in uh, stems from uh, another big interest in our lab that is biohybrid robotics. So biohybrid robots are robots that combine biological components, for example, muscle cells and neurons. Um, and artificial components, typically uh, an elastic biocompatible scaffold that provides the structural template around which the cells self-organize and provide functionality. For example, uh, locomotion or reacting to some environmental cues, lights or chemicals or electric stimulations. And so because these robots are biocompatible and we have been developing techniques to model, simulate and design and fabricate robots across scales from uh, hundreds of micrometers to a few centimeters, um, we one, one, you know, down the road, one potential application of these biocompatible robots is, is of course, potentially medicine. And, and since they all operate in fluids, um, viscous streaming 
seems like an appealing mechanism that these robots can leverage to manipulate the fluid environment around them. And for example, transport particles, you can imagine transport a drug payload, for example, um, or in general assembly structures around them and things like that. So, <clears throat> so if you want to really leverage uh, this viscous streaming in this other setting, we need to understand what happens when we move away from simple geometries. Um, okay, so the way we attack this, this problem is through uh, computations, experiments, and theory. And in this talk, I'm gonna talk about mostly computations and experiments. Um, so the first thing that you need is a solver that is capable to capture these type of effects. These are second order effects. So you need to be able to have a clean numerics to capture them properly. And so the methods that we used, uh, I'm not gonna go into details here, but just give you the main features. Uh, is based on remesh vortex methods that are uh, where you have particles that carry around some properties of the flow and are periodically remeshed so that you keep you know, nice convergence properties. Uh, we capture interfaces through a characteristic function. Um, we capture the interaction from the body to the fluid through Brinkman penalization that basically extends the Navier Stokes equation and creates a forcing term that modifies the fluids. And then the reaction from the fluids to the body. We capture it through a projection approach, and we do that in an unbounded domain. So this uh, this type of approach of methods we've been developing um, throughout the years, and we have applied it to a number of settings in 2D, 3D, bluff body flows, a different Reynolds numbers, by locomotion, swimming, and things like that. And so the first thing that we do is to apply this approach to streaming problems and see if it works. So here is a simulation where we see um, a cylinder, let me step back a second. We have a cylinder immersed in an unbounded domain. The cylinder is characterized by diameter 2a. It oscillates with a small amplitude epsilon a and with a frequency omega. And it's immersed in an in, in incompressible fluid of viscosity nu, okay? So um, if you want to characterize streaming, uh, basically all you need is to characterize, to determine, to figure out what is the streaming Reynolds numbers which is defined up there. You have a U0 a characteristic velocity of your system. In this case, uh, related to the velocity of the oscillations, you can compute an oscillatory Reynolds number. And when you multiply that by epsilon, you obtain the streaming Reynolds numbers. And that's all you need to um, characterize your system. Okay, and depending on the streaming Reynolds number, you will see different flow regimes um, and with different topology. So here we are, in uh, um, the well-known double layer regime. So the, 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 the cylinder oscillates. And as you see, after a few cycles, an initial transient, um, what we're plotting here is the average stream function per cycle. After a few cycles, the, the, the streaming field is established and it doesn't change anymore. And you can see uh, these this characteristic features of having an inner layer constituted of four pillows, if you like, and an outer layer that extends to infinity, okay? In the case of a cylinder, uh, there are only two possible regimes. Um, uh, one is this one, this double boundary layer, and then double layer, and then a single layer regime, okay? So fine, we are able to simulate them, but we want to you know, make sure that we accurately simulate this type of uh, flows. And so we validated our solver both in 2D and 3D. So if you look on the left, this is a validation against 2D cylinders. And so we, we can, we match uh, experiments, both experiments and simulations. And so here, what you can see, there is a plot of how the flow looks like uh, as we vary the Delta IC, which is proportional to the Stokes layer thickness versus Delta DC, which is the thickness of the pillow region that I mentioned before. And so for low Delta IC, you have, a strong streaming field where the pillows are really close to the body. And as, L, as D, delta C increases, the pillows increase their thickness. And then you undergo a divergence and basically the outer layer disappears and the pillow extends to infinity. And now you have the single layer regime. So in the case of the cylinder, only two uh, topologies exist, the double layer and the single layer. And in the case of a sphere, there's a similar Mechanism. So what, what is shown here in panel B is uh, um, a stream, the stream function in 3D. In this case, is the Stokes stream function, which we can plot because the flow is axisymmetric. 
and you can see it's similar to the um, to the cylinder only there are some subtle differences for example the center of those pillows are not um, positioned at 45 degrees anymore but they are at some different angle and we can match those angles exactly and uh, and comparing to experiments we match the relation between delta dc and delta ac okay so uh now that we have um a, a simulation tool to you know investigate these problems we start thinking about what happens as we move away from uh, a uniform curvature type of object like a sphere on a, or a, or a cylinder and we want to understand whether we can generate novel flow topologies and whether we can take advantage of these flow topologies, okay? So the first thing that is useful to introduce is to start thinking about these flows from a dynamical system perspective. Uh, this is particularly convenient because the stream function might, in the case of the cylinder, is pretty simple and you can differentiate uh, rather easily just by eye, but it might get more complicated and so, uh, characterizing the topology in terms of critical points where the flow velocity goes to zero and in 2D you have only saddles and centers and orbits which are the connecting streamlines between critical points you can um, obtain a sparse representation of the flow field topology and its underlying dynamics so this is a nice compact way to represent um, your flow field and it becomes particularly handy in 3D because in 3D, the stream function might not even exist uh, if the flow is not axisymmetric. And so you need some other way to, to think about the flow and characterize the flow. And the other nice thing that we can do, especially in 2D, is that we can uh, equivalently represent the stream function, which is steady, so it's time invariant, with um, uh, an autonomous Hamiltonian system. And the advantage of doing that is that um, these autonomous system typically rely on one parameter bifurcation parameter that we can slide back and forth and see how the topology change uh, changes depending on this parameter and understand these changes in terms of bifurcation theory and so we can gain a physical ins by representing the string function in terms of the Hamiltonian we can gain a physical insight on how we may be able to manipulate the flow topology um, okay so after introducing this, this concept, um, we want to study what happens in terms of curvature, okay? And so there are different ways you can think about it. So one way is to immediately start deforming a single object immersed in your flow. And if you do that, of course, you have multiple curvatures, but you also have a continuous set of curvatures, right? If you go from a point, a point on the surface of your object at a certain curvature to another one, then uh, there is a spec continuous spectrum of of, of uh, curvature values that bring you from one to the other, okay? And so we somehow wanted to avoid this, this pollution. And so another way to think about it is, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but we will see that generalizes well to individual objects, is to think of a lattice, okay? Where you have a periodic um, repeating of cylinders and these cylinders might vary the radius. And by varying the radius, you're varying the curvature. And so the advantage here is that you can inject precisely discrete curvatures into the system, okay, without having this continuous spectrum. And so that's that's the way we think about it. We think about curvatures initially in terms of this lattice model, and uh, and by doing so we can create a phase space, use the dynamical represent um, viewpoint to characterize the phases in this phase space, um, and the phase space is characterized on one axis by the ratio of curvature between the largest cylinder and the, and the smaller cylinder. And on the other hand, by delta AC K max, which is basically a proxy of the streaming Reynolds number. So we can vary the flow and we can vary the curvature and see what happens. And then we can understand what happens by using dynamical system theory. So that's, that's the idea. So we attack this problem and we start simulating this periodic lattice um, across spanning this phase space and see what happens, okay? So if we keep k max, k mean, the ratio between k max, k mean equal to one, then uh, what we see is nothing surprising, okay? Basically, this is what you see on the right. Uh, this is the lattice, just, you know, um, a section of the lattice. <clears throat> and uh, you see two different regimes, two different topologies, and these are 
a direct extension of what you would see in the case of an individual cylinder. Okay, so for an individual cylinder, you have the single layer regime, which is shown on the left, and a double layer regime as you increase the streaming Reynolds number, or alternatively, as you decrease the delta AC kappa, which is the, the curvature. Um, and you see reflected that into the lattice, okay? So now the outer layers don't extend to infinity. They cannot because of the presence of the other ones, but the, but the, the topology is exactly the same, okay? But as soon as you move away from k max, k min equal to one, then a whole lot of new topologies appear. So this is, uh, this is what you see as soon as uh, the ratio of, of kappa starts increasing as a function of the flow, um, flow regime. And so, as you can see, the, the, the system becomes very rich and there's a number of things happening at once. And um, <clears throat> we identified seven uh, phases plus one that is kind of a hidden phase, which I'm gonna briefly mention later on. Um, and each one of them, if we look at it from the point of view of um, orbits, heteroclinic or, um, uh, homoclinic orbits and critical points are characterized by different topologies, okay? So here's the phase space, how it looks like. You can see all the phases in there, plus that thick line is basically a very thin sliver where this hidden phase is, is hidden, okay? So you really need to vary the parameters slightly to see it, but there's this extra phase in there. So, so the, first, the first objective here was to and there's to, I mean, to prove that um, as you vary the curvature, you can access different flow topologies and, uh, and creating a map of it, okay? And so now we see that there's seven plus one regimes that we can access depending on the flow regime and the curvature. Uh, but the other thing that is more interesting is to understand how do you access the, the, these different phases, okay? So you wanna characterize the transitions that the phases undergo because you wanna use them later on if you want to design something meaningful. And so here's an example of how we can do it. So let's take, for example, phase two, which is uh, represented here and is the classical two-layer um, solution for the, uh, for the cylinder in the lattice setting. And so we can identify the critical points and the connecting orbits. And then we can look at what happens next to it in, in phase five as we change the curvature. Okay, and we can draw a parallel by writing the corresponding um, autonomous Hamiltonian system. So by basically figuring out that, okay, there are two uh, saddles that we need to consider in a heteroclinic orbit, we can figure out what the form of the Hamiltonian system is. And, uh, and this is what is represented here at the bottom for beta, this bifurcation parameter equal to zero. And as we slide beta, what happens is that we break the heteroclinic orbit and we separate the two saddles, okay? Which is also what we see in phase five. So here beta really means something, is the curvature, okay? So the curvature ratio is beta. And now we have learned that by sliding this parameter, we can trigger this um, uh, heteroclinic orbit bifurcation and split the flow um, as, as illustrated in, in, the, in the simulation up there. Here's another case where you can do the same. So we are in phase five, the one that we saw before. Again, we have now two centers and a saddle, two homoclinic orbits connecting them. And as you increase the size of the cylinders by varying the kappa ratio, basically you're pushing the two centers closer to the saddle and they eventually collide and they disappear leaving only one center, which is what we see in phase seven. And similarly, starting from phase five, we can construct the corresponding Hamiltonian system. Um, <clears throat> and, and we see the exact same transition as we, as we vary beta, okay? From a, a negative value of beta, we have two centers in the saddle and um, uh, represented on, on the left. And then as beta increases, these, these critical points come close together and eventually collide. And you have a supercritical pitch for bifurcation, okay? So, and this you can trigger it in two ways. So if you see the boundary between phase five and phase seven is slanted, okay, it's, uh, it has an angle. And that's because beta can be represented in this case by the curvature ratio. So you fix the flow regime and you just vary the curvature or you fix the, um, uh, the curvature and you vary the flow regime and you can undergo the exact same 
bifurcation, okay? And so uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can clearly identify for each one of the phases and for each one of the boundaries, the corresponding Hamiltonian system and the corresponding transitions. And so now we have a map in which we have the phases and we have the mechanism to, tra to transition from a phase to another, okay? In this lattice, simplified lattice model. Um, then obviously we are interested in uh, shaping individual objects. We, are, we don't wanna be bound to this um, periodic um, somewhat artificial model. And so the idea is that can we use the insight from this phase space and apply it to understand what happens in the case of individual objects. So um, here's what we did. We took some of the very few studies in which people from Tatsuno in the seventies from uh, where people looked at, um, where Tatsuno looked at uh, objects other than a cylinder in, in a flow. So here, what you can see is a triangle, okay? And he varies the streaming Reynolds number. The streaming Reynolds number decreases from D to E to F, okay? And, and what it does is reports what it sees. But now we can explain what is happening here and we can map it to our phase space. So the way we do it is that obviously this is not a lattice cylinder anymore, but everything that holds for the lattice cylinder still holds locally uh, for individual objects. So what we can do is take, for example, phase the, uh, the flow feed of Tatsuno uh, represented in D and look locally at the critical points and the orbits that we see. And so there we have a saddle and two centers. And then we have another saddle that we don't see, which comes from infinity, okay? And so this corresponds to the phase, the hidden phase that is this kind of thin sliver in our, in our uh, phase space. And now, because we could place this particular feature in our phase space, we know what is gonna happen if we vary the streaming Reynolds number, which is what Tatsuno did. We are gonna go close to phase seven and then undergo um, um, an uh, umbilic bifurcation, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, and then transient into phase six, okay? And so by just looking at the theory on the top, you can see that what will happen according to the theory in our phase space is that as we increase the streaming Reynolds number, we decrease the streaming Reynolds number, the saddle and the center come closer, the centers come closer together, they collapse and they disappear. And so this pocket of flow that you see completely vanishes in phase seven. And that's exactly what Tatsun observes. And that's also what we observe in simulation when we run the exact same one-to-one -one experiments. Okay, and if we do that for, you know, the other experiments that Tatsuno ran, we, we can predict what happens and match them both theoretically and in terms of simulations. So, so this gives us an idea of how we might design an object um, by using this knowledge. Uh, so the, the point is that we are gonna look locally at how the flow looks like and identify what type of transition uh, bifurcations are available to us and, and select the ones that help us design the flow that we want, okay? So here is a thought experiment, if you like. Imagine that you wanna go from a cylinder and start morphing it to create a shape. We call it here a particle transport bot. I mean, it's, this obviously is not the full robot, but just, just to say a different shape that is able to effectively transport particles, okay? So imagine that this shape moves in a fluid and we want to be able to effectively carry particle, which may represent our drug payload um, uh, behind our bot. Uh, how do we design it to do it effectively, okay? So if we do it with a cylinder, you'll see in the next slide that that's not, that's not a good way to, to transport these, these particles, okay? Um, so one, one, what we would like to do is really to create some sort of nice, pockets downstream in the, at the bottom of our shape where we can trap the particles. And as the shape moves, the particles are carried around. So if we start from one, uh, we see this is the, the double layer regime uh, for, a, for, a, for a cylinder. And so if you want to create these back pockets down on the bottom, the first thing that we need to do is to unfold that heteroclinic orbit and split it, okay? And we know how to do it. We just need to trigger in a heteroclinic orbit by slightly changing the curvature. And if we do that, so we, we render this object a little bit more curved 
there on the left and on the right, and a little bit flatter on the bottom, then we split this heteroclinic orbit and we create this double homoclinic orbit plus the centers and saddles that go with that on the sides, okay? So this is still not good. Remember, we want to create this pocket on the back of the, of the object, okay? So what we would like to do next is to, to break apart this homoclinic orbit, so to create a large uh, recirculating flow on the side, and this will push the, the two uh, recirculating area that you see down in the bottom in image two together, creating the pocket that we need. And so now we know where we are in our phase space. We know how we can have the homoclinic orbits collide, uh, the, the critical points collide to remove the homoclinic orbits. And we just do that uh, by, by modifying the shape accordingly. And so the result is three, where you can see that we destroyed those homoclinic orbits. We opened up these big spaces on the side and we created the pocket on the back. And now if we um, decrease the streaming Reynolds number a little bit more, we can bring the pocket together and create this strong um, type of um, area or region where we can see the particles and transport them along. Okay, so, so basically here, what we are trying to do is to take a solution that we know, the cylinder, and rationally having in mind the flow topology that we would like to have, uh, rationally design a set of transitions that bring us to that flow topology to then use it, okay? And then we want to test whether it works, okay? So here, what we are seeing is, uh, <clears throat> is a movie where we have the cylinder and our design kind of bullet robot, if you like, and we drag these two objects in two separate simulations with a, with a constant speed. So they're characterized by linear Reynolds number 90 in this case. And we put a particle, a passive particle behind in the flow, and we see whether we can drag this flow, this particle along. Okay. And we can imagine that, you know, as, as these objects move, they generate some sort of wake in the back and they will transport for a short time this object along, but then eventually lose, lose it. And so that's what we see here. So uh, here I'm just plotting the outlines of the, of the payload and, and, the, and the shape. Uh, but this is a, a full um, flow simulation, okay? I'm just not plotting the, the flow field. Now we can trigger streaming by oscillating the cylinders. And the hypothesis is that now the streaming field, which kind of overlap to the wake, it doesn't overlap exactly, obviously, because the system is nonlinear, but, but we can think of it as superimposing a streaming field to the, to the field generated by the moving object and, and hoping that that will help. And so if we do that, we see that in the case of the cylinder, it doesn't help that much, but in the case of the, of the, of the bullet object, then uh, it's very effective in trapping and carrying along the payload. And if you go back and really look at the streamlines of the system, we see that uh, this is on the left, on the right, uh, we see that the, the bullet shape really basically brings the streamline together. It, it, it compacts them uh, in, in the, um, um, in the here the on the left of the of the object that you see and because of that that corresponds to a higher upstream velocity and this helps to carry along um, our particle um, so so it seems to work it seems to work in terms of computations and not only when you have streaming but when you have streaming plus motion into fluids and that's not necessarily a given because streaming is a second order effect and so we might think that the wake is you know just um, overriding the effects of streaming, but we can, uh, in some specific setting, we can really leverage it. Then the question is, does it work for real? Okay, simulation seems to work, but if we test it, does it work? So we team up with um, someone else here, the university at UIUC, uh, Gabriel Juarez, and one of his uh, students, Giri, and uh, to test our predictions. So what we do is that we build the microchannel. <clears throat> Uh, where we can oscillate the flow with a buzzer um, and we can uh, create our lattice inside this microchannel and image the flow that we obtain, okay? And so uh, the point is to span the regimes that we see in simulations and verify that they appear in experiments. And so in the case of the two most simple ones, the one that really stem directly from the single cylinder, 
we see a good match between experiments and simulations. So all the critical points are there and the flow looks exactly the same. So what I'm imaging there, what we are imaging there is really just a cell of this, um, of this lattice, okay? So that we can really zoom in and look at the critical points. And if we span the, the phases that we predicted computationally, we see all of them and the match is, is pretty striking. Uh, I mean, we can really see all the same, the, all the features that we predicted numerically, uh, we can see all of them experimentally. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the first, um, you know, hard verification of our simulations are not um, completely off, but actually they are rather predictive of, of what happens. And the second thing is that we wanna test whether, you know, our bullet design really works, okay? And so here is another experiment where we basically replace the lattice with the pillar shaped as our bullet. And as you can see, as we vary the streaming regime, we observe all the phases that I presented before. So even in more complex geometries, our simulations really predict very accurately what happens for real. So here you can really see all the critical points and all the, all the flow topology features that we predicted computationally exist, um, exist in reality. Um, and then the next question is, okay, so now we have a, an understanding of it. Uh, we can design and accurately simulate this system. Can we do something useful with that? Okay, because that's the whole point. Now that we can access different flow topologies, what can we do that was not possible before? And so here is a few examples. So we can, for example, um, clear a stream or a region in a stream uh, from particles. So what you see here in the movie, you will see that the bullet indeed generates this pocket in the back where you can trap a bunch of particles effectively. And then we see the comparison when you have a flow past this object and when we trigger streaming uh, at the same time. And so when you have flow past this object, well, this is what you would expect at the low Reynolds number, the particles just deflect around, around the object and then go back um, together in uh, undisturbed in the wake. But when we uh, trigger streaming, so when we start oscillating the flow on top of the mean stream uh, velocity, then we see that, that the bullet is very effective in trapping uh, particles in the back and clearing the flow downstream. So the particles really go past the bullet and they basically almost undisturbed keep going, like they go around the lobes in front and then they keep going downstream. But there's a region right behind the bullet where we really trap all the particles and they are separated from the flow and this is a clear region where no particles go anymore. And so you can imagine to extend this type of clearing for, of particles from a free stream and create a filter. And so that's what we did here. So we quantify how good these systems can be to filter out um, particles of different sizes. So here is only one size, but you can see that basically by accessing different um, flow regimes, which are characterized by these different colors, red, the green, and blue, we can have different um, um, filtering efficiency, okay? And for one of them, the blue one, we can get to basically separate 90% of these microparticles going through. So you have a bunch of microparticles going in. If you don't have streaming, all of them go through and come out of the end. When you switch on streaming, depending on the phase in which you are, uh, some of them are very efficient in retaining the particles inside the filter so that very few come out. And this is just by designing the streaming field appropriately. And then there, there's a bunch of things that you can play with. You can separate uh, particles selectively based on their size. Um, you can, for example, separate a, a subset of them and then release them sub subsequently. And you can do all that here is in with only, I don't know, eight, eight cylinders in, in the length. But of course the efficiency can grow if you put 16 cylinders, nothing comes out anymore in this case. So it's a very efficient way to do it and you just need a buzzer basically to, to do that. Um, as we were doing that, 
So as I started, I was talking about, hey, there's you know this opportunity of using uh, viscous streaming in case of uh, um, in in the case of um, <clears throat> changing well changing geometry. But as we were doing these experiments and casting these microchannels, which are made of PDMF, which is an elastomer, we realized that elasticity is important. And, and this goes well also with our biohybrid robots because these are soft, okay, the biological components. So what happens if we start playing around with that? Okay, so the first thing that we had to do was to extend our solver to capture really um, hyperelastic effects. So I'm not gonna go into the details of that. Here is just a few benchmark simulations. Uh, we, we compared our software, uh, software results with a number of benchmark problems and uh, assess its accuracy. Here is just a few demonstrations where you have some soft objects colliding on the rigid objects colliding on a sort of soft trampoline. Uh, we can do active, um, um, active deformations, which comes handy if you think about um, biohybrid robots where you have muscles. So we can have an active zone that mimics a muscle and then a soft body and then get it to swim. So here's an example of of a jellyfish, and you can uh, extend this to multiple. So you can extend that to multiple body and have many of them going together, colliding, and, and so on. So, so this is. I'm not going to go into the details of the numerics. Uh, this is something we recently submitted, but we have developed the capability to uh, to do that. And so now, going back to streaming, if we take our cylinder um, and we just run this classic experiments, but we render the cylinder softer and softer and softer, then you can see that we can affect the streaming field. So here, for example, um, the diameter and the flow regime is unchanged. The material properties of the cylinder changes. And as you can see, as the, as the cylinder becomes softer, the, um, the streaming field becomes stronger, more compact around the cylinder. And so this is actually quite unintuitive, but now we're developing some kind of pen and paper explanation of this and it starts making sense. Uh, but this is just highlights another, another uh, parameter that you can play with to affect your streaming field and manipulate it in, in a desired way. Um, and then of course, we wanna see what happens in 3D, okay? Because uh, eventually we live in the 3D world. And so 3D is a little bit more complicated because well, obviously it's 3D, but uh, you, the stream function becomes more complex and exists only in the case of axisymmetric flows. And so here the dynamic representation becomes more important, uh, but it's also more complex because you don't have only saddles and nodes, but then you have these other critical points that are node uh, in one plane, but saddles in the other two planes that they can be attractive or repelling. And then you have foci, so you can spiral in or outward, and then also these Bochai, saddle, saddle type of nodes, okay? So the first thing that we do is to just simulate a sphere that is something that we know and see if our dynamic representation matches what we are expected uh, to see. And that's, that's the case. So we see the two regimes that we are expected to see. Uh, you see the two layers, uh, both in the stream function, but also in the um, dynamical system representation. So you have these pink and yellow uh, regions, which are basically sets of um, um, centers and, uh, and saddles, and they highlight the, the centers of the, of, the, of the two layers that we see in the case of D or the one layer that we see in the case of B, okay? And so same as for the, for the cylinder, as soon as you start changing the curvature and you go away from a perfect sphere, some interesting things happen. So here in the case of an ellipsoid that is oscillated um, horizontally so that the flow is axisymmetric, we can still construct the, the stream function. And we see the single layer regime, regime. We see the double, the double layer regime, but now a new regime appears, something that was not predicted before. And, and that's what you see in C. And so there you have the, the uh, basically the lobes that surround the, the ellipsoid plus these pockets aside. And so these pockets are the ones that we used before in designing the bullet. And so we can think that we can do the exact same game here in, in 3D. <clears throat> um, 
And here is even more interesting when you take that ellipsoid and you flip it horizontally, but you still oscillate it horizontally. So now what happens is that the flow is not axisymmetric anymore. So you cannot plot the stream function. And now you need to rely entirely on your dynamical system representation, but it's still useful to understand what happens. So we start with this ellipsoid at the low streaming Reynolds number. We scan for the critical points. We identify a few of them, uh, the ones in there, and they're all pot foci, repelling or attracting. And then we can see the particles over there and highlight the rings that we see. So the centers basically of the rings, okay? And so this is the, the simplest case of low streaming Reynolds number. But as you increase the streaming Reynolds number at the end for higher ones, you would expect to find the double layer regime again. But what happens in between is very complicated. Uh, I mean, it's very rich. And so, and so you can see that, the, that these geometries undergoes a set of transition that brings you to the final double layer regime. And now through our dynamical representation, we can understand what happens. So you have the ring in the single layer, you start increasing the streaming Reynolds number, a set, some saddles come in from infinity as they approach the body, they undergo a pitch for bifurcation. So they split into two foci and a saddle, this now a repel repelling saddle. And so you create these structures on the side of the ellipses. And as you increase again, the streaming Reynolds number, new saddles come in from the other side. They again undergo a pitchfork bifurcation. And now you see a saddle now attracting and two foci that are um, attracting and they eventually merge creating the rings. But now the rings are not aligned in the direction that we expect. They are perpendicular to the inner rings, okay? And so, but what happens is that when you increase again the streaming Reynolds number, the two rings kind of come together, kiss, undergo another bifurcation, and then they rotate and we recover the expected solution. So there's a lot of opportunity and it's very rich in terms of dynamics, what happens when you go to 3D. And of course, if you go to, you know, so you change the topology, then you have all sorts of new behaviors in here. So we're just starting tr trying to understand what happens in the case of a tori. And we think there are opportunities to basically stagger tori in different ways so that you can kind of transport stuff along in the, in the hole of this tube, basically. <clears throat> okay, but finally, let's go back to the biohybrid stream, uh, biohybrid robots, uh, which was our original motivation. So can we elicit streaming in these settings? So that's, that's not necessarily given. Okay, so here is just some examples that we've been working on. And so we have been developing the capability to develop these systems from ranging from uh, micrometers, hundreds of micrometers to centimeters. So you see here something that swims, this phototactic stingray that is able to follow light. We have been developing a walker that is able to maneuver. That's what you see on the top there. So those are the muscles that basically move the legs. <clears throat> and we've also been developing a neuromuscular swimmer so this is very interesting here. So what you see, the kind of black patch is not just a muscle, it's a muscle. And next to it, there's a neural sphere, a, a cluster of neurons. And so we can stimulate the neurons optogenetically by shining light and the neurons command the muscles and the muscles contract and this thing swims uh, slowly, but it swims. Okay. so. So the way we are trying to test whether we can elicit streaming is the following, we generate a torus, okay? Now we know how the torus um, streaming field looks like. And uh, so we seed basically these muscle cultures into a toroidal wells. We let them there a few days, so they mature and become able to contract. And so then you can see that they compact and they can form this, this ring. And then we put this ring in a tiny tank with a glass rod and we hang the, the muscle in there. And the muscle is able to contract on its own spontaneously, or you can guide it electrically or uh, optogenetically. But here is the spontaneous, by, uh, spontaneous twitching. So you can see that it's twitching. Now the, this move is low down, but it twitches and it contracts, okay? And so we can capture, we, to do this study, we, we teamed up with Leo Chamorro here at UIUC. So we do PIV around this, this object and we compute the average velocity field and we see basically the, the structures that we expect to see in the case of a torus at the low 
streaming Reynolds number. So these average velocity, if there's no streaming, wouldn't be there, okay? And we also perform um, POD analysis and we see that all the energy goes into um, the steady mode, which is the one that corresponds to streaming. So basically the story that I told you today is that there is an opportunity to go beyond classical viscous streaming and leverage complex geometry, topology, and mechanical properties of your system and to, to leverage interesting fields that you can use for some application. And we also demonstrated that there is possible to generate biologically this type of, this type of field. And so this is basically the take home message of, of this talk today. I wanna conclude just one minute uh, to say, give you a little bit of a glimpse of what we do in the lab. So the fluid dynamics component is ever shrinking somehow because other projects are becoming uh, very demanding. And so what we really spend most of our time nowadays is modeling the neuromuscular infrastructure of complex biological systems and then translating what we learn into uh, soft robots, biological robots, understanding how to control these systems with a variety of approaches um, in order to grab, maneuver, locomote, things like this. We also use our models to study granular system made of slender soft objects. And there we can see that there's some, you know, interesting behaviors happening. And then we are also studying roots dynamics in granular systems with some group, with a group in, uh, in, in Tel Aviv University. And there's, there's a number of other studies relate at the interface between robotics, fluid mechanics and control. <clears throat> and so what you see here actually is a, is a tentacle, is an arm of an octopus. So we reconstructed the entire musculature there and we can actuate the various muscle groups so as to achieve a whole sort of repertoire of motions. And we are understanding how the neural infrastructure is governing the actuation of the systems. So, but the, but the overarching theme really, theme here is really to bring together these mechanical simulations to design more and more complex biological robots that are able to affect the environment and leverage the surrounding environment uh, to carry out a certain set of tasks. And finally, I would like to thank a number of people. So on the, on the left, there is my team. So everyone is working on many different topics, but really the fluid stuff that I showed you today is these three students, Teja, Fan, and Yash. Teja is the one that started this entire business in viscous streaming, and then Fan and Yash came in and helped out um, developing this, this entire story. And this is a subset of our collaborators, Gabriel Juarez and, and Giri, uh, the top uh, row, Leo Chamorro and Leo, his student, second row, Tair Saif, Onur, Aydin, and Sengui. In the third row, they helped us with some of our biohybrid um, robots. And then Sasha, uh, who's somewhat involved in everything that is streaming. I didn't show anything of the work that we are doing together, which is more related to rectification of forces, but we have um, you know, a collaboration going on with him. And with that, I would like to also thank all of you for your attention. I can start with a question actually. It's, a, it's just not really a technical question. It's a naive question. You talked about biological systems mm -hmm. and is there anything biological in nature at smaller scale that uses these kind of sort yeah. of oscillatory motion because it's, it looks a bit appealing also in terms of nutrition, not only for particle uh, yeah. filtration, but it looks like at the back, you can sort of bring in, even in a stationary flow field, you can bring in nutritious uh, particles. Uh, this, is, this is not such a naive question, actually. I mean, there's actually a little bit of controversy around it. I think I'm, I'm not aware of, you know, an ultimate, clear evidence that um, that bacteria or ciliate type of um, uh, type of organism or larvae um, that actually do use streaming to filter or uh, attract nutrients or things like that. But it's very plausible. I mean, the, if you do a pen, and we did, if you do a pen and paper calculation, uh, the, 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 the frequency of the ciliary motion in some of these bacteria, for example, or larvae, and if you take their dimensions, 
then you can access some of these streaming behaviors. So whether they actually do this is, this, I, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, you know, clear evidence of that, but I think it's plausible. And, um, <clears throat> and that's, I mean, and it's, it's an interesting question. And the other thing to, to think about is that, um, you know, if you do this pen and paper calculation, you can see that you are barely able to access some of these, uh, some of these uh, regimes, but these don't account for complex geometries and don't account for elasticity. And now we know that you can shift the regimes around by using these other mechanisms. And so, so maybe um, organisms that are able that do use streaming. Um, I mean, if, if we were thinking of streaming in terms of rigid objects and you know classical theory, we, we would think that they shouldn't be able to access this regime, but maybe due to elasticity and so on, they, they can. So, so I think that's, that's an interesting question. I'm not aware of any um, ultimate demonstration, but, but I think it's possible. Do you know if the geometry affects the stability, not of the, part, uh, not of the particle dynamics, but of the flow itself? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I think, <clears throat> so, okay, everything that I showed is steady streaming. So that means it's stable, right? It's, it's just there, that's what, you, that's what you generate. So if you, if, if, if you remember the, the phase space that I showed at the top uh, bottom right corner, there's written jetting regime. So there you lose stability and then you start having some unsteady effects. And, uh, and you can shift the jetting, the jetting regime is, is well known in, in, uh, in cylinders, okay? So when you increase the amplitude too much or you increase the streaming Reynolds number too much, the pillows kind of, call, you know, kind of merge on the sides and generate jets horizontally or vertically depending on the oscillations. And so by changing the geometry, you can either accelerate or postpone this jetting. Um, so that's something we observed in simulations. And I think that's the most I can say about, about that. I don't know if that answer your question. It says uh, underwater sand ripples are created by water waves, oscillating flows, which uh, induced steady streamings from the from the throw to, to the crest. Hence, because of the sand particles transport, the curvature of the sand, ripple cha sand ripples changes in time due to both grain rip uh, ripening and ripples merging. I think you can test the phase transition from your region uh, one, the two recirculation region, towards others by looking at the, by looking to, to the time evolving curvature due to sand accumulation. Your dynamical oh, okay. system plot could be opened up by scissors to describe ripples, half cylinders to simplify, separated by a given wavelength. I yeah. So I so first of all, I was not aware of that. That's that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, that's a setting we never we never thought about. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with this particular setting, but but I'm uh, yeah. I'm, this is this kind kind of surprising. Then. This is quite interesting. So we have seen, you know, uh, studies on streaming in, of course, microfluidics, inertial microfluidics, uh, primarily, but also, for example, recirculation in arteries, blood flows. There is there is the, the additional difficulty of that you have viscoelastic, well, rheological um, flows. Uh, but I never I've never seen anything like it with sand and deposition and things like this. That's that's quite interesting. So. So, well, thanks. Thanks for the comment. Very interesting work. Thank you. In your application, you mentioned that the muscles you need, you see, uh, can contract spontaneously. Could you explain this a bit more or point me to a reference on how you manufacture these? Yeah. So, so, okay. So, yes, I can point you to references. Some, some of this work is actually uh, from us or experimentalists. So if, if you, if you go to our website, you will see some of these biohybrid robotics uh, works, and you can see the protocol in which that we and, uh, use to create these muscles. But basically, the basic idea is that you have a well, you put some physiological solution in there, you see cells. In this case, these are skeletal muscles uh, cell uh, stem derived. So you you put 
you put the stem cells in there, you put the, 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 uh, the physiological solution in there, and then you can see the myoblast or not, some other type of component, and then you need the, some, some matrigel uh, components to enable the tissue formation and compaction. And what happens is that in time, these cells fuse together and generate these long um, muscle cells that align and they stick together due to the matrigel and generate, generate the tissue. So after this, this process, uh, the, the muscle tissue is formed and one of these properties that is spontaneously teach, twitches. Uh, it does it once in a while. The nice thing of skeletal muscles is that they're also controllable. So you can render them optogenetic and then really pace them by showing them light. Uh, but, but you, and so in that case, the spontaneous teaching um, goes away and it's paced by the external stimuli. But if you don't do anything, they just spontaneously do that. So the biological mechanism, why they do it spontaneously, I'm, I'm, I don't know, uh, is something that we just observe and that we leverage in this, in this case. Uh, but I think uh, by now all the tissue engineering of how to create this type of um, lab grown muscles is it's pretty established. There are five or six labs that routinely or more that routinely do that and use them in various type of applications. So it's something definitely reproducible. We do it over and over. Okay. There's another question from a maybe Alvaro, Alvaro Marine, if I'm not mistaken. It says nice work. Does the doesn't the presence of walls in the microfluidic channels affect the overall flow. I it don't does. remember you discuss how your model behaves close to passive walls and boundary layers. It does, it does. The boundaries of course affect the flow. So, and, and in fact, so what we did to really do a one-to-one -one comparison with our periodic lattice is that we image the entire lattice in the micro channel and then we carve out a cell in the middle. So the wall, wall effects are not present, but as you shift and focus on cells that are getting closer and closer to the wall, you start seeing um, you know, differences with our simulations that is fully periodic uh, because one, the lattice is not periodic, so it's finishing, and two, because you do have a wall. And also the stiffness of the wall matters. Uh, if it's too soft, you, I mean, it, yes, the, the boundary effects due to the wall are definitely present, and we did not show any of it in our simulations. Um, so for the comparison, we really look at the, at the center of the lattice, which is the least affected by the boundaries. 